Welcome to Millennium Bible Institute's introductory lesson on the timeline. And today we're going to be looking at a biblical timeline. Now you've probably seen a number of these if you've spent any time studying the Bible at all. But there's some important aspects of the timeline that we'd sure like to orient you to. And so since this is going to be a single session, we'll get ourselves right into it. First of all, here on the whiteboard, we've kind of put a timeline up to, uh, uh, that encompasses most of the things that we want to talk about. Now, again, this is not meant to be complete and have every detail. There's a lot of things we'll, we could plug in and a few things we will plug in as we go along. But what you need to understand is you are looking at a dispensational timeline. If you do not have a dispensational understanding of the Bible, you will never understand the Bible. It'll be a confusing book, and it'll be a, a book that contradicts itself. But God really has laid this thing out very marvelously so that when you rightly divide the Word, you're able to go through this timeline and see how everything falls. Now, if you're wondering about that phrase, rightly dividing the Word, also on this website, we have an introductory study to rightly dividing the Word. Let me encourage you to uh, go and see that when you get through here at the timeline. This will be a great introduction for you. Rightly dividing the Word, of course, is going to come back and clarify a lot of these issues, and, and so you can, you can do that at your leisure. But as we look at the timeline here, I want you to notice that we have pretty much all the books of the Bible that are running across the bottom. God has created doctrine for every time in history. Now, right now, we are in the dispensation of grace, and uh, when this thing is over, that will be at the rapture of the church. Now, we'll come back and talk about this, but I want to get you oriented to where we are. And when the Apostle Paul, who is our apostle for the dispensation of grace, for us Gentiles, writes doctrine for us, it is in the books of Romans to Philemon. You're going to find in those 13 epistles all the doctrine that you need for living in the present dispensation of grace. Now, Paul and the body of Christ, that's the program that's at work now. In other words, the Lord gives these uh, inspired scriptures to the Apostle Paul, and he's writing doctrine to the church, the body of Christ. That is the second of two great programs that unfold in your Bible. The first program is his program with Israel. And if you look back on this end of the timeline, what you'll see is, beginning in Genesis 12, you have that Abrahamic covenant, and you have promises made to the nation, and then their program begins to start from there and run all the way through the book of Malachi. Then when you get into the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see here that even though the gospel of the kingdom is being preached, it is to Israel that that gospel is being preached. Now, there are verses that we're going to talk about that will show us that this is specifically to and about Israel. So just as you come out of the Old Testament and come in to the gospels, you are still in the Israel program. And then as you move from the gospels into the book of Acts, and then right here, let's go ahead and insert the cross. Because this is the thing that happens at the end of the gospel accounts. And as you move it into the book of Acts, the thing you need to understand very clearly in your mind is that the program with Israel is still running. Most people think, well, at the cross, that's when God stopped whatever He's doing with Israel, and now He's doing something with us. It is not at the cross at all. As a matter of fact, that's the subject of Old Testament prophecy, that after the cross there would be given an extension of mercy to Israel to repent and receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. For uh, during the time of the Lord's earthly ministry, He gives a parable about that extension of time that's going to be given to the nation. The cross is not the end of that. And as a matter of fact, when you get over there in the book of Acts, you'll see Peter over there preaching in Acts chapter 2, identifying his audience over and over Ye men of Israel, ye men of Judea, ye that dwell at Jerusalem, all the, that kind of terminology, they're in there for the feast day on Pentecost, and he's addressing the members of the nation. You'll see in the next chapters, he says that all of this preaching that they're doing after the cross is to give repentance to Israel. And he keeps talking about this same audience over and over, and you can follow this through in chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and just bring it right on through. 
There are three honest opportunities that are given to the nation during this time as Peter is preaching to the Lord's little flock. Now, if that's a term that's unfamiliar to you, you should know that the little flock are the members of the believing remnant of Israel. Israel is divided into two parts. You have the apostate nation and the members of the believing remnant, or as the Lord called them, His little flock. This is the minority in Israel. And so what you have is, as you come up to the cross, some, the, the Lord performs certain actions to make everyone make a choice. You are either going to be in with the apostate nation, rejecting Jesus as the Messiah, or you are going to believe He is the Christ, and you are going to follow Him. If you do, that makes you part of the Lord's little flock. And so following the cross, Peter and the rest of the apostles are preaching to the nation who have rejected Jesus as their Messiah, as the Christ, and they are giving them three honest opportunities to change their mind, to repent and receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They reject all three of those opportunities. And upon the final rejection at the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, what you expect is the thing that all of the Old Testament prophets said would come to pass. It's also what the Lord Himself talked about. And that is this tribulation period or the Lord's day of wrath bursting onto the scene, the judgments being poured out during that Daniel's 70th week period, and then, of course, all that culminating in the second advent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the setting up of His kingdom. But instead of the Lord standing up there in the third heaven at the right hand of the Father to usher in His day of wrath, instead, the Lord returned back and, and appeared to Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul. He was saved on that Damascus road. He went into Damascus, received His sight, and then began immediately to preach that he had seen the resurrected Jesus and that he was the Christ according to the Jews' Old Testament scriptures. Paul is then ushered off to Arabia, and when he returns, he has been given the revelation of the mystery. And that's his term. That's a Bible term. Now, I'm fully aware that most of you have probably come up in churches where you have never encountered this kind of terminology, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. I'm sure that you haven't spent much time looking at those verses that say that this program that God ushered in with Paul was hidden from the foundation of the world and kept secret from the beginning. And those, that's the exact terminology that the Bible uses about this. No one saw this part of God's program coming, and there was a reason that that was hidden. It was necessary. But when God interrupted this program with Israel, so let's do it like this. As you start here and you start moving through, you have this program with Israel that is in effect all the way up to Acts 7. And then God interrupts this program with Israel. He saves the Apostle Paul, and then he begins another program, not with the Jewish nation, not with the Hebrew nation, but with the church, the body of Christ. Now, the reason I'm saying it like that is because the word church is one of those words that uh, we kind of throw about like it always means the same thing. There are a church is ecclesia. Many of you know that. It means a called out assembly. But I will tell you that that word church in the Bible refers to different churches. In other words, different called out assemblies. You have Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness, and they're called the church in the wilderness. You have another one uh, out here during the kingdom, and they, that is the messianic church. That, that, that's the church of the, of the kingdom out there. But then you also have a different group here, a group that was never spoken about in any prophecy, and it is called the church, the body of Christ. Now, that term, even though you may have heard it and you may have said, oh yeah, we're His body, we understand, but there is a very specific reason that you are given that title. 
that title, the church, the body of Christ, is not just, you say, well, I understand over in Ephesians it says Jesus is the head and we're the body. But the sense in which we are the body has to do with our vocation out in the heavenly places in eternity. That's the reason we are called the church, the body of Christ. Now, that would actually need a study all on its own, but I'm telling you that to say that there is uniqueness about all of this program. And when you get to hear on the timeline, what you're looking at is a different apostle, Paul, from those who carried on this program with Israel because these, this program was carried on by the twelve. This program is introduced by Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. So you have a different program. You have a different apostle. Paul's very unique in what God has called him to do. And then you have the gospel of grace. What you have back here is, I've called this the gospel of the circumcision, but what you're going to see that called over and over again is the gospel of the kingdom. Because that gospel said the kingdom is at hand. And so, I'm sorry, I've got you here. Well, they are preaching the gospel of the kingdom there. Gospel of the kingdom here. It's the gospel of the circumcision here. And it does, I guess I could leave that up there. It does include the gospel of the kingdom. And that's for sure. The thing is, the apostate nation is going to have to receive Jesus as their Messiah to have any hope of getting in on that kingdom. So back here, Jesus is preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist came along preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus commissions the twelve after he chooses them, and he says to them, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go ye to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom is saying, your Messiah is here, repent, so that you can make it into the kingdom when it comes to pass. This is a timeline that begins to move along for Israel all the way up until the time that God sends Jesus among the Jewish people so they can receive Him as their promised King and Messiah. Instead, they reject Him. And Jesus sees that rejection coming. And because He sees that rejection coming... There is a point in his ministry, it actually starts at about Matthew 11, but it really manifests itself in chapter 16, where he says to his apostles, don't preach that I'm the Christ anymore. There's a judicial blindness that is cast over the Hebrew nation, and then, of course, at the cross, they crucify him in ignorance. Uh, yes, they do crucify him but they don't realize some very important things they need to. And it's during this extension of mercy in Acts 2 to 7 that God is allowing them to repent and see the truth under the administration and the testimony of the Holy Spirit. When they reject that testimony, that last instance being the stoning of Stephen, that's when God interrupts that program, and that's the fall of Israel right here. And the rest of the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 7 onward through to Acts 28, is the historical record to the Jewish people to explain their diminishing. And those are terms that Paul uses over in Romans chapter 11 as he talks about this subject. That Israel has fallen, and now there is a diminishing. In other words, there are members of the little flock that are alive when Stephen is stoned in Acts 7, they don't die just because the program stopped and they are not imported in the dispensation of grace to become part of the body of Christ. They are still members of the little flock. That's the gospel they believed and that's the program they believed it under. So there is a diminishing aspect going on for Israel in which God now you see the diminishing of Israel and you see the rise of the Gentiles. The historical record that's given in the book of Acts is to explain that fall and diminishing of Israel. When you get to the book of Romans, now you have Paul carrying on doctrine to the church, the body of Christ, preaching the gospel of grace, and he never preaches the gospel of the, uh, in the, gospel of the kingdom by saying, repent, the kingdom is at hand. He never says that. 
And as a matter of fact, Paul never uses that expression, the kingdom of heaven. Now, as you come through this this dispensation of grace, which I have to say at this point on the timeline, Paul makes it very emphatic that we are not under the law, but under grace. In Romans chapter 6, where he first begins to talk about your sanctification in Christ, he makes this very clear. And the reason he makes it clear there is because what God is doing with the church, the body of Christ, during this dispensation cannot be performed under the law. It is necessary for this dispensation to be one of grace. Otherwise, the very things that Paul talks about in these books that God is trying to accomplish will never be accomplished because grace has the power to do especially two things that the law, which was enforced during the Israel program, never could do. It never could do what grace could do. And so what sin did, grace not only had a cure in the forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross, but grace has the power to restrain sin so that you can live unto God. That's something that cannot be done under the law. The law has no power to to give you any power over sin. Grace can restrain sin, and grace gives you functional life. Now, if that's another term that is a little bit strange to you, then the thing you need to do is know that you need to start right where Paul starts you in the book of Romans. And as you come through your sanctified life in chapters 6 through 8, he is going to introduce you to functional life and functional death and the fact that only grace can produce functional life for a believer in this age. Now, the real comedy about that is, is that so many people want to believe that they are earnestly serving Christ by living under some form of the law. The law is completely done away with under grace because if you're under the law at all, Paul says you're not under grace at all. So if you're under grace, you have the power available to restrain sin and to make you functionally alive unto God. If you're under the law, you are not. We are operating as sons with the spirit of adoption in the dispensation of grace back under the Israel program because they're under the law. They're dealt with as children under tutors and governors. There is limited decision-making here. Here, we have sonship decisions that we make all throughout our saved life. Well, th- those are issues that are not, uh, they're, they're particular to these points on the timeline But I just want you to understand that this this period here is a very unique period, and it's the period that you're living in now. As I'm taping this in September of 2010, this is the dispensation of grace still in force. This this thing, the rapture, the blessed hope has not taken place yet, and, and we're still going through this particular time. When this dispensation is over, God is going to resume the program with Israel that He interrupted back here, and He is going to bring it to a completion in the kingdom. And this thing is the subject matter of the books in your Bible that run from Hebrews to Revelation. When I told you at the verse of this that if you didn't know how to rightly divide the Word, that the Bible would never make sense to you, you have to understand. Now, I'm going to make a statement that... I'm not, I don't mean to shock you and put you off of the study with, but you cannot run from one end of the Bible and pull doctrine out from, from Malachi and then from John and then from Hebrews and back to Ezekiel and then 1 Timothy and think that all of that goes together in harmony because it doesn't. You're talking about books in which the dispensation of the law is in effect and you're mixing it with a dispensation in which the law is not in effect, but grace is in effect. And then you mix it again back over here where you have the subject of prophecy again, and they're back under the law. So when you're in the book of Hebrews, a book that by its name should indicate to you is written to not Gentiles in the dispensation of grace, 
but to Hebrews. That's specific. In verse 2 of that first chapter in the book of Hebrews, he gives you a time element in the last days. Now, if you know accurately about the last days, you know it is the last days of Israel's program. I know people like to come back and say, oh, we're living in the last days, and they make that as though, you know, the rapture must be closer in the last days. The Bible never uses the term last days in reference to the rapture. The Bible uses the last days in reference to the Lord's second advent where He comes at the end of the tribulation here, fights the battle of Armageddon, and destroys His enemies and sets up His kingdom. It is the last days of Israel's program. That's why it was the subject of Israel's Old Testament prophets. In the last days, this will happen to you. In the last days, this is going to take place. In the last days, these are the signs. The sun, the moon, and the stars will go dark. And, and, and all of those kinds of things will be happening. That was the last days of Israel's program. But that program got put on hold. Then God is moving this program for the dispensation of grace. And when this is completed, he'll resume this program with Israel again. You'll see the sun, the moon, and the stars go dark. And those things are talked about in these epistles. These are the things that, that comprise Israel's last days. So what I'm really trying to show you is, before we just kind of walk through the timeline, is that there are two great programs that are at work here. The first one gets interrupted and that secret program called the mystery, it was called a secret, it was called hidden, that program was introduced upon its completion. The scriptures say that in the last days God will resume this program with Israel and bring it to a completion into a kingdom that will have no end. Now, let's kind of walk our way through the timeline a little bit and we'll add some things on here. First of all, way back over here on the end, you know, you would start with Adam and the first man. But when you talk about Old Testament, a testament with reference to the law, that's what Old Testament is about. That, that covenant that was made under the Mosaic law. So you're not really Old Testament. I know we kind of get used to the way those things say, because right at the beginning of Genesis, it says the Old Testament, and then you have blank pages, and then it says New Testament. But really... How this happens is God is dealing with the nations as they come along until you get to Genesis 10 at the Tower of Babel and a fellow named Nimrod that set up a kingdom over there in the land of Shinar in which he had determined, at which he had brought things to the place that the nations did not want to retain God in their knowledge any longer. As a result, God consigned them over to the adversary and introduced from Abram a covenant in which he would make of him a great nation and, and this promise encompasses things that go all the way to the kingdom with regard to what he would do with this new nation that we, he would create from a man and a woman that were too old to have children. They have Isaac when they're old. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob is the father of the 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes begin to multiply. And you see this people get larger. They come out of a 430-year captivity in Egypt in the book of Exodus. And they journey in uh, to Mount Sinai. They receive the law. They go to the land. They're supposed to conquer the land. Under Joshua, they do okay for a while. And then things go downhill. And a series of judgments that God gave them back in Leviticus 26 begin to come upon them. Each judgment successively worse and worse. And, and it's at this point, let me point you to another timeline. Now, we're going to take you off of this screen and put you on the PowerPoint. And what I want you to see is on the timeline on your PowerPoint, you'll see on that main timeline a 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And that, are, that is the five cycles of judgment that God intended to bring upon the nation. He told them that back when Moses was still alive. And, and those cycles indeed did come. That first cycle was the 450 years uh, under the judges. And he said, and if you don't repent for all that, I'll bring the second cycle of judgments upon you. And indeed, they did come under the ministry of the prophet Elijah. He said, if you don't repent, I'll bring the next cycle of judgments in upon you. And he did. And that was under uh, the ministry of Elisha. And he said, and if you don't repent for those judgments, I'll bring the next cycle upon you. And they did not repent, and he did. And the evil kings and the divided kingdom and all that took its toll upon the nation. And then God said, and then if you don't repent, 
I will take you away captive and leave the land desolate. And at number five, on that timeline you're looking at on your chart right now, that is the Babylonian captivity where they were taken away captive for the 70 years to Babylon. And then we find out when they're away in that 70-year captivity, there is a prophet by the name of Daniel that is given information that lets us know that that is not the end of the fifth cycle, but that there are parts to that fifth cycle. And that third part leads all the way up to the cutting off of the Messiah. And there is one seven-year part left, and that seven years is right here in the period of time that we call the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. And those are the things on Israel's program. So as you're working through this timeline, you start the program with Israel, with the covenant to Abraham. You have the cycles of judgment as they begin to make their way through. You have 400 years of silence between those testaments. And then you have John the Baptist heralding the way for the, the Christ. And you have the gospel of the kingdom being preached. And that's what's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then when you get to the cross, after that you have a one-year extension of mercy. And Peter is preaching to the apostate nation to repent and change their mind about Jesus. When they reject all three opportunities, miraculous opportunities. And matter of fact, the religious leaders say, we cannot deny what is happening. But they don't want it. So what they do is they stone sin. In fact, the thing gets worse and worse. The first, and the, at the first opportunity they're given, what they do is they just kind of get on to them. They just, they just say, don't do that anymore. The second opportunity, it escalates and they throw them in prison. But they're broken out of prison and they go back to preaching. And, and then when they hear that, hey, the guys we thought were in prison are actually out there preaching... Well, that raises the level again. When they get to the third opportunity, they kill Stephen. You can see this rejection growing in the nation. And as it grows and gets worse, and at that third one, God interrupts that program. That's, that's the stoppage of that program. And then you see a diminishing taking place. God calls out Paul to be his special apostle to the Gentiles. And something very wonderful happens here is that there is a message of salvation carried to the Gentiles not through the agency of Israel, which is the only way it was ever known back here, but that we were carried a message of salvation in spite and apart from the nation Israel. Now, I'm not using those two phrases, just throwing them out there. When I say in spite of the nation Israel, I'm saying this message is not even a part of this program. And when I'm saying apart from them, I'm saying it is not through the agency of Israel. It's not a part of their program, and it's not through them in our program. It is completely unique and separate. And that is why in this age, simply by the grace of God, a person can receive Jesus Christ as their all-sufficient Savior, and He will forgive their sins, justify them unto eternal life, put His Spirit within them, and give them functional life. Now, those are the things that can be done in this day. Then when you get to the end of this, we know that this time ends at the rapture of the church. And contrary to popular belief, we will not be coming back to this earth to rule and reign with Christ. Those verses all come out of the program with Israel. We, instead, are going to be going to the heavenly places. Now, that's another phrase that people are not really familiar with. I didn't say heaven. I said the heavenly places, and there's a difference. When you get out into eternity, you are not spending eternity in heaven. You are spending eternity in the heavenly places. And there are things that you will specifically be doing there you will have responsibility in those heavenly places. Now, you may be wondering, well, what will I be doing in those heavenly places? And my answer to you is going to be, it depends on where your sonship edification is when you leave this planet. Because that is your education that trains you for the work you'll be doing in the heavenly places. Now, we'll go through the judgment seat of Christ. That is not a judgment for salvation. That is a judgment for reward. 
In other words, where you did get to, you are going to be rewarded accordingly at that judgment. But then the world is going to be going through this terrible time of tribulation in Daniel's 70th week in which the judgments are going to be poured out in greater and greater measure until it reaches a zenith at the end of that seven-year period. And the Lord will come back from heaven with His heavenly army and He will, at the Armageddon campaign, destroy Israel's enemies and set up the Davidic kingdom that was promised back in the Old Testament and he will sit on the throne of David and rule for a thousand years. At the start of that kingdom, Satan is not thrown into the lake of fire. He is thrown into the bottomless pit. It is in that pit that Satan gains some very important knowledge for something that he wanted to do from the very beginning. I just have a few minutes left, but I have to tell you this. Back when Satan got the principalities and powers to rebel with him, 23 of the 24 principalities joined Lucifer in his rebellion along with many powers and lots of angels. He usurped then, he, he, he had de facto control of the heavens and he became the prince of the power of the air. When Adam fell in the garden, Adam was the fu first monarch on the earth he was to have dominion and if you'll study that word dominion you understand what that entails he was given responsibility he named the animals he was supposed to subdue those are all that's a military term in the bible everywhere it's mentioned and when he talks about all of that when he falls satan takes usurped possession of the earth but there is something he needs to do to put those two together to maintain that hold and that was the very thing that was being done at the Tower of Babel. When it says they were building a tower that might reach unto heaven, you don't actually think they were constructing out of brick and mortar a tower that was going to reach to the moon. You would run out of earth. You can't get to the first nearest thing. What was being constructed... What was being done there was something that would actually unite the heavens and the earth that would allow him to maintain possession of them. When he's in the bottomless pit, he gets that knowledge. I won't tell you who gives it to him, but he gets it. And when he gets that knowledge, when he comes out of the pit, that whole rebellion is one last-ditch effort to now accomplish what he sought to accomplish all along and never could get done. So he is going to bring those armies against Jerusalem where Christ is sitting on the throne and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. That is the last great battle. And that happens here at the end of that thousand-year kingdom. And the reason for the thousand-year kingdom is because there are more enemies to, pe to be put down yet. And those are all going to be purged out of the kingdom at the end. Then you have the great white throne judgment where the dead from all ages are brought up. Now remember, we are already in glorified bodies. We've already gone up to the heavenly places. But every all the dead that were not saved, they are, now the, the righteous dead, there's a resurrection out here. They get resurrected here. But the rest of the dead don't live until the thousand years are over. That's what Revelation 20 says. And when they get brought up to the great white throne, they're judged out of the book of works to determine the degree of their punishment. And then the book of life is open, and whosoever's not found in, written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. Then they cast in the lake of fire. There's going to be an eternal kingdom. But that starts out with a thing called the dispensation of the fullness of times. No way we have time to talk about it. Except to say what Satan knew he had to do back in the beginning. God is going to do in the dispensation of the fullness of times. So that there is a. I want to use the word, I want to use the word a union between the heavenly places and the earth. It is a very unique thing. And the Bible talks about that when you get over to Ephesians and Paul talks about that, when he talks about the dispensation of full of times, he talks about making all one. And he talks about a unity. And you're going to be very involved in that. 
So from the standpoint of you, here's your timeline. You're somewhere in the dispensation of grace, and you're either waiting for a day that you die or a day when you get raptured out. And wherever you are in your, in your sonship edification, when that thing takes place, you'll be judged at the judgment seat of Christ to get reward for that. You'll go into the heavenly places and assume the position commensurate with your sonship edification, and you will be what? And by the way, there's a warfare. One of the things that we have a spiritual warfare that we fight now is in preparation for something we'll actually be doing in the heavenly places out there. There's a whole lot more that goes to this timeline than just simply giving you a list of things. And I know what you're probably looking for when you click this thing on was to say, well, l- let me see the date of, of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of the temple. And let me see the date of when, uh, and, and, and I'm not really interested in that because you can know all those dates and those things won't do for you what you need. What you need to see is that you have a specific place in the program of God. You are not part of the Israel program. Your apostles are not the 12 and you're not under the law. Your apostle is the apostle Paul you're in the mystery program and your gospel is the gospel of grace and God is doing something very unique and special with you as members of the church the body of Christ to put you out into the heavenly places to function in a very particular way with the creature and if you don't know what that is it's because you haven't gone to Romans 8 and gone through that part of your edification yet and that by the way is why you even have this name the body of Christ I'm just, and I, I, I know that's a little unfair to throw that out there, but I'm doing that for you to understand there is a lot for you to know about this timeline. What we're doing here is we're, I, I, we're not really even skimming the surface here. I've tried in a very short amount of time to take you from zero to at least some kind of understanding about how the programs work through the timeline and the way things are going to fall out at the end. But listen, we have only... We are not even seeing the tip of the iceberg here. There is much more work to do. So what I hope that you'll do is join us in the studies that we make available here at Millennium Bible Institute, that you'll take a look at the other introductory studies here on the website. And if you see something that interests you, I hope you'll get it, you'll study it, and it'll work to your edification so that it'll pay eternal dividends out there in the glory that shall be revealed in us. And that subject is huge and and consist of way more than you could ever imagine. Now, I hope I've piqued enough curiosity for you here to at least get you going on it. Join us in more studies and learn more about uh, your vocation out in the heavenly places and how you'll function to the glory of God. God bless you.